Robert Theodore Trumpy Jr., born in March of 1945 in Tremont, Illinois. Grew up in Springfield. Was a big star in football, basketball, and track. In fact, he played four different, played in four different state championships in high school. Two in basketball. And in 1963, now think about this for a second, okay? We think about these athletes, and, 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 and but, but then when you get to tight ends, a lot of great athletes, but you think these big, huge, strong guys, and Trumpy was that. In 63, in the state of Illinois, he won the state long jump championship, finished fifth in the state in the high jump. So from there, was off to the University of Illinois in Champaign. You couldn't play as a freshman back in those days. So his first year playing, they play him at wide receiver. Catches 28 passes, 500 yards. Decides, though, to transfer to the University of Utah. We're going to find out why here in a minute. They moved him to tight end. You had to sit out a year after you transfer. He catches nine passes his only year at Utah in one year. He was then drafted into the United States Navy after graduation. Spent 180 days in the Navy during the Vietnam War. In 1968, he's discharged. He goes back home, starts his career as a salesman. Then he finds out he's drafted by something called the Cincinnati Bengals. In the 12th round of the common draft, he instantly becomes a starter and a star under head coach Paul Brown. Caught 37 passes for over 600 yards, was an all-star in the AFL, voted all-league tight end the following year. Then in 1970, you get the merger with the NFL. And Trumpy was arguably the best tight end in football. 35 receptions, almost 900 yards, a franchise record 23 yards per catch. 23 as a tight end. He wound up playing until 1977, was a two-time All-Star, two-time Pro Bowler. He finished with 298 career receptions, 4,600 yards, 35 touchdowns. His yards, touchdowns, and... 15 yards per catch average for his career are the best ever by a Cincinnati Bengals tight end. His broadcasting career was among the greatest of all time, a career that would earn him the Pete Rozelle Award in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. So, Bob Trumpy, with that introduction, he's made his home here in Cincinnati ever since he came here back in the late 1960s. Trump, how are you, young man? Great to have you with us today. Uh, that was a quick recap of 55 years, TB. Well, you, you've you had quite a, a run over 55 years, Trump. I mean, really, it's amazing what, what, what you have done. Yes. You know, it's one thing. I know Paul Brown used to talk about, you know, your, your, your second career, which turns into really your life. But for a lot of guys to go to, 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 from being – great in one thing and then to become great in another it's i mean what a blessing yeah well uh when you look back on it uh as when you get to my age you do that a lot in a lot of situations uh there's always somebody behind you that seems to help uh and in my case uh, the first person I thank is my wife for sticking with me. Uh, we were married in 1966. We're coming up on 57 years married. Two, for the NFL, I have to credit a, a, a gentleman named Zeke Bratkowski. Recognize the name, Tommy? I don't. You don't? I don't. Okay, I, I'll get I'm back sorry, to I'm it. Sure I, I'm sorry I don't. Please tell me about it. I, I'll get back to him, but let me, that, that's my football career. My broadcasting career, I have to give a tip of the cap to one Ken Fouts. Your dad and I's good buddy, and you know him. Uh, he was the number one sports director for NBC at the time, worked with Mike Weissman. Now, the uh, I was drafted, and I wasn't a salesman when I was drafted, Tommy. I was collecting bills for beneficial finance in Los Angeles. Uh, that's the best job I could find out of the Navy. By the way, I was in the Navy, and I never set foot on the water other than being on Treasure Island 
uh, stationed there in the middle of San Francisco Bay. Mm -hmm. Now, I get out, go back to Los Angeles. I get this job collecting bills, get a call one day from my wife. I've been drafted by the Cincinnati Bengals. Uh, I said, I think that's the Bengals, dear. She said, <laughs> oh, whatever. But does that mean we have to go to Cincinnati? Yes, that means we have to go to Cincinnati. So uh, I'm collecting bills in Los Angeles, and I figure I got to get a construction job of some sort to get me in shape. I mean, I, I had done nothing athletically for the uh, previous, I don't know, nine months. I drive by a junior college in Southern California, which back then they had a bunch of junior college. It was San Fernando Valley State Teachers College. And I see several guys, uh, they don't look like kids. Uh, they look comparable age to me working out on this football field. And I drive by it and the next day I stop. I think, well, you know, I, I got to find out what's going on here. They might be able to help me. Uh, as I walk up to the group, I see on the, the ground uh, a great big bag. And on the side of it is a Green Bay Packers em emblem. And the guy running the practices was Zeke Bratkowski. Zeke Bratkowski was Bart Starr's backup. Uh, during the Lombardi era of the Green Bay Packers. So I introduced myself, and he said, what position you play? I've just drafted by the Bengals uh, for tight end. He said, great. I have only one other receiver here. The rest of these guys are running backs, and there was a quarterback there. I think his name was Bruce Lemmerman, uh, and he was drafted by the Atlanta Falcons. So I said, look, can I join the group? And he said, sure, absolutely. Uh, he said, what time do you get off work? I said, three. Uh, and I said, I'll be here as quick as I possibly can after I get off work tomorrow. I get there about 3.20, uh, and they had already started practice. Uh, two days later, uh, they moved practice back to 4 o'clock so I could be a part of it because – I could catch the ball. We started the practice. Each practice was Zeke Bratkowski with 75 up downs. That's what, that's how Lombardi got his team in shape. So I was in the best shape of my life, I think. Uh, the draft was in March. Uh, we worked out six days a week from March until about the middle of June. Uh, and, and they weren't extensive uh workout probably an hour hour and 15 minutes just i was running green bay packers patterns so at the end of that uh in june uh zeke says i gotta go to green bay and i said well i'm supposed to show up in cincinnati um july 2nd and uh, he said i want to tell you something i'm going to tell our scouts that if your name ever comes up on the waiver wire, uh, get him up here in Green Bay. He said, you can start for our football team. I said, what did you say? He said, I'm telling you, uh, with your uh, athletic ability, you can start for the Green Bay Packers. I'd love to throw you the ball. Psychologically, no one's ever told me that, ever put me in that spot. And I credit Zeke Bratkowski with, uh, one, physically get me, getting in shape. Two, psychologically, putting me in a different area than uh, I have to think anybody who was drafted by the Cincinnati Bengals in 1968. And uh, he didn't tell me what to do, what not to do. He said, just, kept doing what you're do just keep doing what you're doing. And uh, I... Sincerely believe without that, that little uh, comment from him about making the Green Bay Packers, the world champion Green Bay Packers, that I could start for him. And here I am, the 12th round draft choice. I don't know, number 300. Uh, it was absolutely amazing, Tommy. And looking back on it, 
Uh, yeah, I could do a lot of things, but that psychological uh, shot that he gave me uh, was huge to my career. And I'm sure how much that your, your dad helped you. I tried to help you. Yes. Uh, yes. A lot of people tried to help. And we should always be thankful for the help that they uh, uh, they gave me. And my wife followed me to to uh, Cincinnati. So turned out to be a pretty good deal because uh, you've never left since then. I, I'm curious, you know, you, when you were playing in college and you initially went to Illinois, and I mentioned you transferred to Utah, um, I yeah, went wait, back wait, and wait, looked wait, at Wait, 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 wait a minute. I was asked to leave Illinois. Okay, all right. Uh, 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 Why were you I asked had to leave Illinois? I had hand surgery uh, from a football injury. I had an infection in my hand. And, uh, my elbow had set in my hand, and uh, th they lanced it through the middle of my hand uh, to get the uh, inf inflammation and infection out. And I was in the local hospital there for probably uh, – maybe uh, eight days. I don't remember exactly how long it was. But in that time, uh, I didn't finish the season. In that time, they fired all the football coaches, uh, the basketball coaches, because uh, an assistant athletic director turned in the sludge fund books for paying uh, some of the basketball players and football players on the University of Illinois team. Well, when I get out of the hospital, I've now missed six weeks of, uh, no, uh, two weeks of class, and I'm left-handed, and my hand was kind of frozen like that because it was wet for five straight days, and then they drew away the towels, and everything was just kind of cramped up like that. I, I could barely write. There was no one to go in the coach's office to say, help me. Can I get a medical incomplete? Can I get some help? There was nobody there. Um, so I plunked out of Illinois. And uh, uh, that's how I got to Utah. I didn't transfer. Uh, okay. Right. Let's let's be let's be honest about everything. Okay. But All continue, right. continue okay. no, your line. I'm, I'm, I'm curious because I, I you know I like to try. We have a lot of younger people that watch the show, and 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 I like to try and put things into context from for what things were like, whether they be in society or whether they be, in this particular case, in the sport of football. Uh, I think your quarterback was a guy named Frank Costardo. I don't know if I pronounced his name right uh, there or not. Okay, back in 64. That team you played for, Illinois, completed, completed for the season 86 passes, barely attempting 150 uh, pass attempts on the year. Um, my, oh, my. I, I mean, that's a different world well, from the one we live uh, in now, right? Yeah, I absolutely agreed. And that's the way just about everybody played. But on that team, uh, his name was Fred Costardo. Uh, and by the way, his mother was a wonderful cook. Uh, <laughs> he lived in some suburb of Chicago, and Fred would have us up there and his mother would make a homemade Italian meal. Uh, but on that team was a guy named Dick Butkus, yep. uh, middle linebacker and short yardage center, and Jim Grabowski, uh, our, our fullback. Uh, and Grabowski broke uh, several Big Ten rushing records. There was no reason for us to throw the ball. And remember, Illinois had gone to and won the Rose Bowl the year before. We could not repeat, uh, 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 even if we won the conference, we could we could not go back to the Rose Bowl the next year. That was my sophomore year. So, yes, we did not throw the ball a lot. We had a very big offensive line, and we had Butkus, and we had Grabowski, and, <laughs> and we used them on almost every snap. <laughs> When Wouldn't you? you? Yes, I, I, I would. When, when you, you know, you go through uh, playing at Utah for a year, uh, you talked about already what you were doing uh, at that point in Southern California, now the Bengals. Had you, were you following the sport enough to know who Paul Brown was? Oh, sure. I knew okay. who Paul Brown okay. was. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. 
And your first time you met him was where? Uh, let's see. I, I got there July 2nd, 1968. July 3rd. Uh, the morning of July 3rd uh, for the entire Cincinnati Bengal organization uh, started with a three-hour talk from Paul Brown. And uh, that's the first time I saw him. And I was sitting in a room with, uh, I can't guess the number, but uh, in excess of 100 uh, athletes in that, in that room. We were right packed right next to each other and uh, kind of had a separated offense to defense. And in the row I was in, I was way in the back. Uh, we had assigned seats. I was way in the back. And in uh, the row that I was sitting, I counted 23 guys that were either going to be a tight end or a receiver on the football team. So I, I, the room was crowded. But the first time I saw him, I yeah, and he's, he's little, and he's old. This is Paul Brown, the Hall of Fame football coach? What? Wait a minute. He's going to lead us to the promised land? And uh, that uh, three-hour meeting uh, extended that evening to another three hours. So we got six hours of the world, according to Paul Brown, on our first day. This is the way we're going to do things. I'm going to tell you what to do. You got to do it to make this football team. He, he went on and on and on and on. And so that was my first meeting. Um, you have a great rookie year. Uh, your quarterbacks that year, uh, two of the three anyway, John Stofa. Uh, and Sam Weish, who, of course, later became head coach and led the Bengals to a uh, Super Bowl yeah. uh, berth. Um, and, you know, you look at that first year of a franchise. And, and, I mean, I can't speak to this because I wasn't a player, but I was around for the first year of a franchise in baseball out in Arizona. Um, th th there is something just so extraordinarily unique about being the first what, what do you recall most, or what did you enjoy the most, or what stood out the most of being on the very first team of the Cincinnati Bengals in 68? Yeah, I, my biggest memories are I had six roommates the first training camp. Uh, all the rookies were on the third floor. Nobody knew anybody. I knew one guy. Uh, and that's the guy that I drove, I, I rode the bus with from Cincinnati Airport to Wilmington College. Uh, he's the only guy I knew, the black defensive tackle from some uh, small black school in the south. And uh, when I checked in, I was told to go to room number such and such and get my room key, did, went up to my room, opened the door, and the light from the hallway uh, woke the guy up lying in the bed, and uh, I don't know, it was 9, 9.30, something like that at night, and he kind of sits up, and he says, I'm Wally Scott, I said, Bob Trumpy, we're roommates, well, I'm, I'm going to hit the sack here, you do what you want, we'll talk in the morning, did, I went in and showered, came back, went to bed, get up the next morning, Wally Scott is no longer in the room, uh, Closer's still there, but he's no longer in the room. Uh, so he was having breakfast. I go over and I have breakfast, uh, read the newspaper, see if my arrival was announced on the front page. It was not. <laughs> I go back to my room. It's empty. Uh, I, I look in the closet. There's no clothes. Uh, other than the wrinkles on the sheets of the bed, I thought I was in the wrong room. He was cut after breakfast. Uh, that was Wally Scott. I had five more roommates, and for the life of me, I can't remember uh, what their names were, of uh, any of them. But my point is, the sheer volume of athletes coming in on a daily basis, uh, it was astounding. You never knew who you were going to line up next to. Uh, you never knew who you were going to have lunch with. Uh, 
I, I mean, the, the, the number of people given the opportunity to make that football team in 1968 still boggles my mind. And, and some guys were there for, they'd bring them in for lunch, run the 40, they'd be gone before dinner. Uh, and that that continued, that cycle continued for two months. I mean, we, we worked out twice a day, uh, very hard, but very short time. Paul Brown's practices were an hour and 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. And if you couldn't get it done in an hour and 15 minutes, you can't get it done. And so at least you knew that in an hour and 15 minutes, this misery is going to be over. It was hot. It was humid. You were trying to beat the crap out of the guy uh, across from you to make an impression on somebody. But I also remember, I did not in that first training camp, I didn't have a scratch, a bruise, a pulled muscle, a laceration, nothing. Uh, I, I don't know how to account for that because in training camp you always get these nagging little things just because of the constant contact uh survived it all and uh it, 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 but but in 1968 preparing for the season uh just the number of people that came in and out of there uh our first game was a preseason game against the pittsburgh steelers in Morgantown, West Virginia, we had five busloads of players drove to Morgantown. We win the game. Uh, on the way back, we go to get on the buses, and they hand us a box of Colonel Sanders chicken. And uh, some of the veterans that we got in the veterans' elevation draft were very upset. This is the way the AFL, the Cincinnati Bengals, is going to function. Bus rides to Morgantown, West Virginia, box chicken on the way home. Uh, I didn't care. Didn't bother me. I mean, this was all new to me. Yeah, I'll, I'll eat the chicken, the biscuit, the french fries, whatever. <laughs> so <laughs> we didn't know what was going to happen. Nobody did. And, and I, Tommy, again, I didn't know anybody. Yeah, I, I, I eventually made a great relationship with Sam Weiss and John Stofa, but uh, it was it was remarkable. And when when it's happening, you don't pay attention to what is happening. But when you reflect back on what happened, yep. you're like, my God. Now, uh, I, I, you know, I, I, I got to ask you because you, you go through that first year. You have a great year. Tell me if this is true. I, I mean, I, I, I've been digging around to try to find out to this answer when, when you had agreed to come on. I've heard people say this, but I don't know if it's true. I've heard people say that, 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 that you were the first tight end in professional football that did not line up next to the tackle, that you would be no, offset. For, is that true? Uh, that is absolutely true, and, and you can't credit me for anything. This was Bill Walsh's idea. Uh, back then, they did not have coordinators. Bill Walsh was the quarterback and receivers coach. And uh, I, I, I wasn't your typical tight end in a lot of ways, one of which was I didn't weigh 250 pounds. Uh, I think when I got to camp, I weighed about 212. At 6'6", 212. Uh, I carried a 10-pound weight with me underneath the towel, so it appeared I was 222. So uh, most of the tight ends in, in professional football at that time were uh, extra tackles. Uh, Walsh could see what I could do. Uh, and we experimented uh, with where I could or couldn't line up. They had to call the league office to find out what the rules and regulations were. And it blew up defenses all over the, uh, the uh, league in the next two or three years, especially when, in 1969, we got Greg Cook. Uh, he was a mad bomber. Uh, but yes, I was the first one to move around 
and I was the first one one to move around because I could do what Bill Walsh envisioned me doing. Uh, isolate the safety on me, and I could beat most safeties in the league at that time, uh, one on one. So, and we took advantage of it, and and that that's that's why you uh, you have those uh, outlandish yards per catch numbers for a tight end back then. Very unusual. Not so unusual now, but very unusual back yeah, then. Yeah. You know, you brought up the name Greg Cook. And again, this is another area because I knew Greg Cook. I didn't know him like you knew him. I knew him well past what had happened in his football life. Um, due to a common friend, you know Eddie Shepard from up in Mount Adams. Very where, close. Where, where, where did you find him when you met him? Where did you find him? Well, he was, he, you know, Eddie Shepard, a lot like you and John Stofa and Sam Weish, was another guy in Greg Cook's life who was trying to help him, uh, especially when it came to a lot of his artwork uh, and things like that, and trying to get him to, to do more of his painting. And, you know, he's, you know, I mean, his whole story you could spend two days talking about. Um, he was the guy at UC. 1969 now, he's the first pick uh, for the Bengals. There are people, Trump, you played with him. I mean, you lined up with him uh, in, in, in training camp when he shows up. You played with him his first couple of le- years in a league before he gets hurt. You referred to him as the Mad Bomber. Uh, you've seen a lot of quarterbacks. You played with a lot of great quarterbacks. You announced a lot of great quarterbacks. You watch them all now. There are some who will tell you that were around uh, back in those days that Cook could have been among the greatest of all time had he not gotten hurt. Yeah, physically, I agree with you. Uh, but the part... That, that was the saddest. Yes, he, he was an absolute magician with the football. Uh, fearless. Uh, he would throw you open. Uh, and back in 1969, that was unheard of. Uh, but, Tom, you, you and I have had this discussion hundreds of times, and you always ask the same question. Could he have been the greatest? All I... Uh, no, and I tried to help him as best I can, just like our friend Eddie Shepard did and does. Mentally, I don't know how Greg would have handled all the success. I honestly don't. I don't know if the injury uh, created his uh, his problems. Uh, I have no idea. I mean, he had two shoulder surgeries, career over, uh, father run over uh, in Chillicothe, Ohio, wife divorced him in about 18 months. Uh, That's a whole bunch for anybody to handle. And and then uh, I I distinctly remember in 1970, after he had two shoulder surgeries, we're in training camp, we all have our fingers crossed, that Greg is going to be back to where he was. And uh, I don't know what happened, but we're at practice one morning, and he's just kind of warming up, and he throws a ball out to uh, uh, the sideline to Chip Myers, who was on the team at that time, and the ball sailed 30 yards over Chip's head. Uh, Greg grabbed his face mask, ripped his helmet off, threw it down, walked in, never saw him in a uniform again. He knew he had torn something else in his shoulder. Uh, Physically unparalleled uh, in all the years that I played and witnessed uh, football. Uh, He scared defenses to death. Uh, We took advantage of it. You, You mentioned... His first year, 1969, we our three starting receivers, which was Myers, Eric Crabtree, and me at tight end, all three averaged over 20 yards a catch. Mm. Unheard of. Yep. Unheard of at that uh, in that well, that's era. That's unheard of. of the, that's uh, unheard era. of now. You don't see that on yeah, any well, team now. You might have agree. one guy on the team, maybe one yeah. at 20, maybe. Yeah, we, we couldn't wait to get on the field with Greg Cook as a quarterback. And he only played 11 games. Uh, we only won three of them. 
and still we had those numbers, th those passing numbers. But uh, uh, it was one of the great tragedies of the NFL, yes. and and uh, as you well know, uh, kept constant contact with him for years and years and years and years and years, and then took him to surgeries, took him to hospitals, took him to doctors. Carmen DeLeon, you recognize yeah, that name? Yeah, of course I do, of course. Sure. Concert master under a console for the Cincinnati Symphony tried to help Greg. Everybody knew Greg. Uh, he wouldn't let me, he, he wouldn't allow me to see where he lived. And, uh, you know, I used to pick him up and I'd drop him off at the McDonald's at, uh, on Mitchell Avenue. And I said, what, what is this? You don't want me to know where you live. And finally, I picked him up one day and he had to go somewhere. And I said, we're not going anywhere until I see where you live. So he takes me where he lives. And it's the second floor of this place that down off Mitchell Avenue. And they make, uh, uh, th this company made uh, color for Procter & Gamble. They produced color that Procter & Gamble would put on packaging. He lived on the second floor. And this uh, company, uh, they made blue uh, coloring for Procter & Gamble. And everything in the little apartment was, uh, had a shade of blue on it. Uh, and it was just an absolute frickin' mess. But displayed up there was some of his artwork. Uh, and it was absolutely mesmerizing to look at his artwork. So he was very good at something. but. Uh, Tommy, his life just is just careened out of control, and yep. uh, to find him, I had it was like like a feral cat, you know, running around downtown Cincinnati. This bar, uh, Sam Weiss and I went down one day, and I I said, I, I don't know where he is, but this is where I go to find him. Sam was living out of town. Went to one bar. Sam paid a $30 bar bill. Went to another one, I paid a $20 bar bill. Went to another one, there's Greg Cook. And so we had lunch and bought his lunch. And it was just terrible. But uh, what an athlete. Yeah, it's one of the great tragedy stories. And look, they're tragedy stories every day. Uh, but but yeah. his was just, it was so painful. For those who knew him well, like you and Sam and, and John Stofa and Bob Johnson and, I mean, others, it was just, it, it was brutal. Yeah. Kenny Anderson comes in now after uh, it's not going to work out with Greg due to injuries. He walks in the door and tiny little Augustana, right? Not all that far from where you grew up. Um, and, and you look at him and, and, and I mean, look in today's day and age, he wouldn't be one of those guys. You're looking at the big draft board if they're blowing it up because he's from a small school. When you first see him, you think what? Well, uh, Bill Walsh told me, uh, I was working at Pogues in downtown Cincinnati. Uh, we all had off season jobs. None of us made enough money to just live on what we made in the NFL. I was working at Pogues. So I would occasionally go down, uh, not to work out. Uh, I would occasionally go down to Spinney Field. And Walsh pulls me aside and he says, we got our quarterback. I said, what are you talking about? He said, this kid from Augustana. Uh, I said, what do you like about him? He said, I'm building a quarterback. I said, are you serious? Is that what you're telling me? He said, yep. Uh, I'm building a quarterback. It's my first chance. I'm building a quarterback. And I, I've told that to Anderson a thousand times. I, I saw Bill Walsh build you, son. You understand? <laughs> uh, and, and Anderson's response is, yep. Uh, for the first two and a half weeks, I didn't throw the ball. I would take the snap and, and go one, two, three, back steps, set, throw. For two and a half weeks, he did that before he threw to anybody. And uh, Wall said, this kid's got everything that we want. He, he's, he's extremely intelligent. He's very likable. 
he has legs like an offensive guard, uh, a shoulder like you wouldn't believe. Uh, I like everything about this kid, and I'm building a quarterback. So I, I can't wait to come across Ken Anderson. And uh, uh, Virgil Carter was the starter, mm -hmm. and he continued to start. Uh, Anderson didn't take over right away. I guess uh, just a veteran versus a rookie. But he was clearly the more accurate thrower and uh, considerably taller than, than Virgil Carter. And uh, I think Virgil got hurt. And, and then Anderson, I think, came in when we were playing Houston. And I, there, there's a tape of Anderson coming in the game against Houston. And I think I caught his first touchdown pass. I, we both think it was his first touchdown pass, but I'm not sure. But uh, he, he was the Bengals' first franchise quarterback. That's the best way to put it. Um, you go on to have a great career. In, in 1977, you retire. You, you own all the records, naturally, for a tight end, and many of those you still own now. Why, why, did, you, why did you hang them up? Uh, why did I hang them up? Uh, two years previous, uh, I was approached by a radio station in Cincinnati about uh, uh, possibly doing a, a, be a guest on a radio show. Now, I had heard while in the offseason in Los Angeles, Bill Russell, the All-Pro Hall of Fame Center for the Boston Celtics, doing a, a, a sports talk uh, radio show in Los Angeles. And I didn't really pay a lot of attention to him, but it certainly sounded like he was having fun. So w when that radio station approached me, it was WCKY, and at the time, WCKY played elevator, mu elevator music during the day. And in the evening, they had, uh, on, on Monday night, they had uh, uh, NFL football with Jack Buck and Hank Stram. They wanted to do a sports talk show an hour before that Monday night broadcast. Would I be interested? Uh, yes, was my answer. And uh, I fell in love with it. So that, that's 75, that's 76. No, that's 75. 70, uh, I play 76. Uh, I'm told by Paul Brown and the Bengals that uh, doing that radio show is a violation of my contract and I can't do it in 1976. So I, I didn't. Uh, 1977, the, the season starts, and we're fine. We're in good shape. I'm fine. I'm in good shape. And uh, I was really upset that they wouldn't allow me, because Paul Brown had always said, this is a springboard. Uh, playing in the NFL is a springboard. You're going to go on to something else. Use this as a springboard. Well, I was using the NFL as a springboard. I loved doing the sports talk show. So I told him in 1977, I'm, I'm, I'm doing it whether you like it or not. And they didn't like it. So I retired uh, to begin a broadcast career. Simple as that. Why do I feel like Trump? And, and, and I mean, you know, this is one of those things when you're a kid, we all have memories uh, as a kid and you're doing one thing or another. Um, I remember when my dad got the job with the Reds in 74, and you'll remember this, uh, down in Tampa, you know, th this was a day and age where all of the players stayed at the same hotel. They didn't get yeah, some big, Bill huge Watson's house, you know, at the Inn. International Inn is where everybody yeah. stayed. And you and your producer, longtime producer, Doug Kidd, why do yeah. I remember you doing a talk show down there I swore this had to be the 70s, and yet you really never started uh, at WLW anyway until 1980, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. on a regular basis with correct. WLW. So where am I getting my wires crossed here? Because I vividly remember, in fact, one show you had Pete Rose, Johnny Bench, and in the same show, Art Schleister was down there doing something or another, if I remember right. 
Yeah, no, it, it, that didn't happen. WCKY had no sports except the Monday Night Football. When I moved to uh, WOW down the street, they had uh, UC football, basketball, uh, the Reds, and the Bengals. And they told me I had to go to Florida. Okay. Uh, you, you, you're going to cover the Reds at training camp. Fine with me. No problem whatsoever. And uh, it was not in the 70s. It, it, it was in the 80, early 80s. And, okay. and yes, we had a lot of people sitting around that, uh, that uh, table around the pool at Bill Watson's International Inn. Who yeah. could forget Bill Watson's International Inn? No breakfast this morning, people. We had another fire in the kitchen. <laughs> Bernie Stowe told me one time that he, he, he put a case of beer underneath a bed in the room where he was staying. He came back the next year, and the case of beer was still underneath the bed. <laughs> hey, uh, the, the years with NBC. Uh, and, and, and look, uh, you know, I mean – when you become the number one announced team and you're working for one of, with one of my family, yeah, Bob Costas with your partner for a while, I would love Bob Costas, uh, and, and then Dick Enberg, who is my favorite all-time uh, play-by-play guy. Uh, you're the number one team of the NFL. Um, you had to be – were you pinching yourself more when you were playing in the NFL or were you pinching yourself more as the number one broadcast team of the NFL? Jeez, I don't know. I don't know how to answer that. I, I, I The people I work with, including Enberg, Marv Albert was the first one, Jay Randolph, Don Crickey, uh, Dave Sims, uh, Joel Myers, uh, Costas, Tom Hammond. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. Yep. But but the, the thing I remember about it, Tommy, is that uh, Ken Fouts, I mentioned him earlier, used to work at Channel 5 in Cincinnati. I get a call one day from him after I'm at WLW doing the radio show. And he says, how would you like to do an audition uh, tape for NBC? Love to. Okay, we go to the basement of uh, Channel 5, which at that time was at Ninth and Elm. And uh, he went along as a play-by-play guy. Didn't know what he was doing, but he was just leading me in the right direction. And I was the color guy. He sends the tape in with a recommendation that NBC hire me. And uh, the, the first year, I had a contract to do three games, did six. Uh, season ends, hoping for the best. Next year, contract to do six games, did nine. Uh, did nine the next year. Uh, following year, uh, full contract, full season. And I think my first full season was with Sam Nover, a guy out of Pittsburgh. So uh, it, it, as far as pinching yourself, no. I, it, it was a goal I had. Uh, aided by uh, Ken Fouts, and obviously his opinion carried a whole bunch for the people in New York. The people in New York wasn't had no idea who I was, and, uh, and 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 so two years into my broadcasting career, I'm I'm moving up, and uh, we didn't think I didn't think in terms of what. Uh, what broadcast team I'm on, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I was reminded every weekend of the percentage of the country that our particular game mm-hmm. is getting. Uh, that, you know that, that's yeah. the way they judge where you are. And we kept, uh, Sam Nover and I kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger games. And, uh, and then I moved to Costas and, and Costas was kind of new to the, to, to NBC from KMOX in St. Louis, and then it kept moving up and up. So as long as you're advancing, you're feeling comfortable. And I kept advancing until uh, finally with Enberg. Uh, did I, 
I got to mention Don Cricky too, you know? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, matter of fact, I was just uh, emailing him back and forth, believe it or not, Bob, uh, two days ago with Don Cricky. Uh, yeah, I had asked him, yeah, about, right? yeah I, I found him. I found him uh, through a common friend. Uh, I reached out to him. This is two, three days ago. And, um, and I had asked him about coming on the show because when I was a kid and my dad was working in the ABA, Costas was an announcer in the ABA back in those days in St. Louis. My yeah. dad's in Virginia. Don Cricky yeah. is like the guy for NBC yeah. basketball, and they'd cover the ABA finals. Uh, and I just remember what an extraordinary talent uh, he was. And I had uh, asked him about coming on the show. He says he does no interviews with anybody at any time. He won't do them. Huh. All right. No problem. Uh, well, uh, uh, Crick, Cricky and I, uh, maybe the most unique pair of broadcasters in the history of the NFL in a very select category. In 1986 and 87, uh, NBC got the rights to the Monday night radio game that was broadcast by Jack Buck and Hank Stram. NBC got that contract. Don Crickey and I were awarded that Monday night broadcast. We also did uh, a full schedule of television games. Uh, so no matter where the game was on Monday night, they would give us a game that we could make plane connections to the right city. Uh, the longest one we had was somebody playing Atlanta on Sunday at 1 o'clock. And the Monday night game was Seattle. Now, in the two years, in the two years that Don Cricky and I did that, one, we never missed a plane. Uh, I, I was the mule. I would carry all the baggage. And this is before uh, security at airports. Cricky would get out of our town car running to the gate, hand in the air, Two full fare first class tickets. Don't leave. <laughs> Two full fare first class tickets, and I'm dragging all this stuff around. We used to. We never missed a plane in the two year period. We did games from the uh, NFL Hall of Fame game all the way to the Pro Bowl on television and radio. About five years after that, I'm in New York working with somebody else. Uh, the NFL meetings, Cricky says, why don't you come over and have dinner? You'd love to see Molly and the kids. Sure, absolutely. He lives in Essex Fells, New Jersey, which is right across the river from New York. I go in the house, first time I'd been in their house, and on the wall is a, uh, I, I can't tell you the dimensions, maybe a three foot by four foot picture frame. In that picture frame, are all of the credentials that Don Cricky got in that two-year period. <laughs> and and I, I, I said to Molly, why did you do this? And she said, I, I don't know, but Don was gone so much, I, I just wanted to keep track of where he was, and he always brought back the credentials. Tommy, in that two-year period, Don Cricky and I did 94 events. A, a television and radio. Uh, think about that. 94 that, events. Yep. Yeah. It, it, in two seasons and never missed a plane. Well, Good what luck were we on talking that in this about? day and age. Good luck on that in this day and age if you had to pull that off. All right, look, before I let you go here, and I'm, I, I could sit here and have this conversation, I mean, because your career, and we haven't even gotten to so much of it, but, but, but I want to ask you about the Bengals' ring of honor. You're up this year. Um, and, you know, I guess it's season ticket holders and suite holders that are ones that vote. Um, are you paying attention to it? Is it something that, that you know, uh, I, 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 more than do you pay attention to it? I mean, how important is it to you, if at all? No, no, no. The fact that I'm one of the – I think uh, 13 guys, or what was it, 17 guys or 20 guys, uh, considered one of the uh, more important guys. That's that's fine with me. Uh, I, I have absolutely no problems with being in or out. 
Uh, I've celebrated everybody that's been in it. Uh, I understand that there are uh, there's a shrinking audience out there. Yeah. Uh, that, that saw what I did from 1968 to 77. That was in the last century, you know. And uh, I, I, sure, uh, I think there should be somebody in there from the uh, original class of the Cincinnati Bengals, and I think I'm the only nominee. Uh, so at some point, somebody's going to say, uh, maybe in 2028, uh, what is that, 70 years since the beginning? The name Trumpy might come up. I, I'm very comfortable with where I am, what I've accomplished, and and uh, who thinks what of what I've done. It doesn't bother me in the least. But sure, it'd be nice. I don't wear a suit anymore. Uh, <laughs> last thing, last but, thing I want to ask you. I, I hope you get in, and I've said all along, it's not even debatable who the greatest tight end in the history of the franchise is. And right there is the beginning and end of it. Not even, even if I didn't know you, that's the beginning and end of it for me. Um, there was a time where you were highly critical of this franchise when you were doing local sports talk. Yeah. Are, are you amazed at where this franchise is now? Not only Burrow and the players and the whole nine yards, but the fact that Mike uh, is is opening up the purse strings, that they're doing things they've never done before. Are, are you in shock after not doing that really for the first 47 years of the history of the franchise, right? Yes. Uh Flabbergasted. I, I was mad in 1978. Uh, Paul Brown was already retired. Uh, they hired Bill Johnson as a head coach. Uh, I thought Tiger was a wonderful assistant. Uh, Ken Anderson breaks his hand in a preseason game in uh, Milwaukee playing Green Bay. Uh, I, I was doing the game. I don't remember who the play by play guy was. Uh, anyway, uh, they fire Bill Johnson. Well, I had heard from inside the franchise, from players, uh, from other people, uh, how Paul w was just browbeating Bill Johnson, something unmercifully. And that's what Paul Brown accused Art Modell of doing in Cleveland. And I at the time was working at WCKY and uh, actually I, I'm sitting at, at a place called uh, uh, having a nice tea in a bar at, at uh, Barley Corns, downtown yep. Barley Corns. Yep. yep. And uh, breaking news, Bill Johnson fired. Uh, I, I, I was very upset. Uh, he didn't deserve that. Uh, Ken Anderson breaking his hand is the reason they started 0-8, uh, but they fired him. I went back to the radio station and I wrote an editorial, the first one I'd ever written, and uh, I was going to be on the air that night, and it was a scathing indictment of Paul Brown and what he was doing and how he was doing it, and I took it into Phil McDonald, who was the... Uh, station manager and I said, I don't know if I should do this tonight. I mean, I, I'm a year removed from drawing checks from those people. And Phil McDonald said to me, well, tonight we find out if you're an ex Bengal or a future broadcaster. Bam, magic phrase. I went on the air, read the editorial, and uh, I promised myself when I started doing that, I was not going to be a sniper. That is, say something and then never confront the person you're talking about. Or write something and then hide out. Uh, the next day I went to practice. And I was standing on the side of the practice field between uh, the building of Spinney Field and the field. And Paul Brown walked out. And I think uh, Homer Rice's practice was about an hour and 35 minutes long. And Paul Brown reamed my butt for an hour and 34 minutes. 
And then as practice ended, he walked in. Bo Harris, a linebacker on the team, uh, as he was walking by me, he said, you realize you ruined practice. And I said, what are you talking about ruining practice? And he said, everybody was paying attention to Paul Brown and his finger in your face. Uh, and he said, we, we kept track. Paul won the gesture battle 100 to 1. <laughs> and uh, I, I went down there the rest of the week. I was there every day at practice. And uh, strangely, Paul never came out of the building for the rest of the week. But you have to make decisions at some point in your career. And that was a decision I made. I was happy with it. I was more than willing to defend it. And the more he yelled and screamed at me, and the more I realized I was right. That So the change in this franchise uh, from somebody who was there in 1968 and had to buy our own gum, you hear me? Mm. Buy our own gum to 2023. Uh, yes, it, it, it's been... Uh, Quite a change. Uh, and I have to credit Katie, Troy, the Blackburns, the granddaughters, uh, just as my kids, my grandkids, when they show up, I, they call me Bob Bob. That, that's the nickname my first grandson gave me, and it's stuck. I'm Bob Bob. And uh, when I have a problem with, with my phone or my computer, uh, my grandkids fix it, fix it in an instant. So uh, I, I think that Mike's grandkids are making him feel the same way I do at times. Stupid. What? I didn't know that. What? We should do that. What? I mean, uh, yeah, it's changed, and it's all for the better to this point. There's no doubt about it. There's no doubt about it. Bob, uh, I can't thank you enough uh, for being so generous. My pleasure. Time. Anytime, Tommy. It is. I love to have you back when the season starts and gets going because I know you watch the games and you're still so on sure. it and with it and knowing what's going on in football. So if you have the time, we'd love to have you back again. Yeah. Now that, now that I know how to get everything hooked up. You're, you're all set. You're all set. You, you surprised me today, Trump. I got to be honest with you. No, 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 no. One of your grandkids must be some... sitting in the other room. They're the ones that got yes, the well. out, I think. All right. All right. Trump, good to Thanks, see you, man. Thanks, pal. All right, buddy. Bob Trump. You too. Bye.